Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, particularly uh, happy to be able to introduce our grand round speaker today, which is Dr. Gail Rousseau. Now, Gail is the clinical professor of neurosurgery at George Washington University, but far more importantly has been her work over decades on uh, really the underdog. If you really look at what she's done throughout her career, which is outstanding in surgery, in, especially in pituitary surgery, in education, there's been a tremendous desire to care for the people who are not cared for properly. This is evidenced by a tremendous global neurosurgery effort uh, and her leadership roles in everything I've ever heard of, from the AANS to the World uh, Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, to key roles with the WHO, and a very important role with what's called the G4, which is an alliance of multiple entities to provide better care in surgery, anesthesia, ob obstetrics to the world. Uh, as a part of this attitude that people deserve to be treated equally, She's been really a very vocal person for diversity, and especially diversity in neurosurgery. I can assure you that the history of diversity in neurosurgery is not an admirable one. Uh, and there have been a lot of people who quietly or loudly have been advocating for change in that. And it's happening. And I'm very happy the way it's happening. And since Gail is really a leader in this, and you may have heard a little bit about global neurosurgery from me, we <laughs> thought it'd be very important for her to talk about this other great passion in her life, which is really about fairness and opportunity, and that's something we stand for as well. So, Gail, it's an absolute delight to have both a friend and an inspiration speaking, and we're thrilled to have you and can't wait till you can visit in person in the near future. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dempsey, and I wish I were there in person. I'm a Midwesterner myself, as you know. I particularly love your campus, and I particularly love cheese, as I was telling Caleb, so I wish I, w I was there, too, and I, I, I want to just recognize my co-authors to this talk at the beginning, and I'll, I'll show uh, some deference to them at the end as well. It is such a pleasure to be here with friends and family, uh, Josh, Dan, Greg, uh, Benny, uh, uh, Mustafa, it's, it's so many people that I grew up with in neurosurgery and that I've long um, admired and enjoyed. So it's, it's really a pleasure uh, as well as a privilege to be with all of you. And then these two uh, I, are part of my Fiends family. Uh, Robert and I have both been involved uh, with Fiends uh, for uh, over a decade, uh, and uh, he has been leading that charge in a way that I'm very, very proud to be part of. And, uh, and Azam is making sure that we stay solvent and is adding so much of his uh, inspiration and dedication to this effort. And I want to especially thank people who you all know well and may not know how really important their efforts are in global neurosurgery. And these unsung heroes are Linda Van Brocklin and Stephanie Schusler, whom clearly I know by name and, and I've come to rely upon them. They are uh, rock stars of global neurosurgery, these two women. Well, uh, no uh, no department led by uh, Bob Dempsey needs me to be talking with them about uh, diversity. He, he lives and breathes equity and inclusion. But let me tell you just a little bit about how I got started on this this year. And uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, Nitin Agarwal is the chief resident at Pittsburgh, where I did my fellowship. And some of you may know him. I think he's he's a real dynamo at like your chief residents are. He's not a fully trained neurosurgeon yet, but he is on his second textbook, <laughs> way beyond uh, where I would have been at this point. But he is the editor of what has apparently become a classic uh, for med students and uh, those doing their sub-AIs called uh, Neurosurgical Fundamentals. But he had this idea to 
write another textbook more about the philosophy or, you know, pearls of, of lessons in leadership in neurosurgery, which he called surviving neurosurgery. And I noticed that there are some senior uh, members of your faculty who are uh, writing chapters in this. For, for example, Robert Spetzler is writing the chapter on uh, life after neurosurgery and, and what to bring into that. Anyway, it's a philosophical textbook, and he asked me to write about diversity. And although I've long been a woman in neurosurgery, I, I decided to put together a group that truly was diverse uh, to write the chapter, which is in press now. But we we developed this into a paper that was published uh, last year uh, in September in World Neurosurgery uh, uh, by this group of uh, people who are diverse ourselves in terms of uh, age, race, gender, uh, religion, sexual uh, orientation, and so forth. And um, what is has been interesting to me is that uh, this has resonated with departments of neurosurgery and surgery, and so we've been asked to give it many times since George Floyd's uh, death this summer, and I think we are at an inflection point. Um, no, no, no time during my career have uh, a dozen universities asked me to present my pearls on pituitary surgery, but yet I think this is the 12th time since June that I'm being asked to speak about diversity in surgery. So it says to me that we are at an inflection point, that we, the topic has our attention, and that means there's potential uh, to, for positive change. So, so let's talk about this in neurosurgery. There are, we always like to start with what we all agree upon. We, we all agree we need the best possible people to go into neurosurgery. We all insist on high performance metrics for those people. They have to have high grades, high test scores, be hardworking, resilient, do research, high case volume. So we understand most of the metrics that predict high quality performance. But it may be that we need to start paying more attention to another key driver of excellence and innovation, and that is diversification. And in the next few minutes, I'd just like to share with you some of the uh, research that our team has uh, come up with. So I'll go over these four areas, and then I hope we'll have time for a little discussion, but m my guess is that Dr. Dempsey's real mission in inviting me today is to use this this presentation as a catalyst for discussion within your own department uh, about these issues. So we'll talk, talk about academic neurosurgery, some diversity issues in neurosurgery, what we can learn from other professions, and some of the benefits of diversity. Now, I don't need to tell a, a well-funded, uh, highly productive research department like yours at the University of Wisconsin that uh, that uh, research and NIH funding is something that we all take very seriously. And NIH takes diversity seriously, and not just because they want to feel good. Um, nobody, anybody who's put in uh, a, a grant uh, request knows that they don't fund you just because uh, they're feeling nice. They they fund you because they want to produce outcomes in research that are important that contribute to human knowledge. and And these are just screenshots from their diversity part of their website. And they feel uh, they not feel they know that diversity leads to innovation. So they, this is a very helpful uh, part of the website to, to get our minds around the notion that uh, it's not just nice or inclusive or the right thing to do, but diversity also drives results. We need to be sophisticated about it and know that there are obstacles 
to diversity there have been in neurosurgery and in, in other scientific and even non-scientific fields. There is implicit bias, there's stereotype threat, there's even institutional prestige bias uh, in all these competitive forces. So I won't belabor the point other than to say that um, if we take academic neurosurgery seriously, we take NIH funding seriously, and the NIH takes diversity seriously. Well, let's look uh, briefly at our own experience in neurosurgery. So this is a historic photograph that shows our early founders in neurosurgery, Dr. And you can see that there is diversity even in one of the first photographs of early neurosurgeons. And I've uh, brought your attention to Louise Eisenhart, who is not a neurosurgeon, but she was the first neuropathologist. And uh, a renowned expert on brain tumors. She was the first woman president of the AANS and the first editor-in-chief of the Journal of Neurosurgery. And what's interesting to me in, um, that I've learned from people who specialize in gender studies is that sometimes an early and outstanding uh, individual who represents a minority group can actually hurt the overall progress of that minority group they represent within a scientific field. The other more famous example is Marie Curie, who famously still is the only person to have ever won two Nobel Prizes in scientific topics. Hers were in chemistry and physics. Uh, but the fact that Marie Curie was celebrated in the early part of the 20th century was, uh, according to gender equality uh, experts, actually something that held back women in the sciences because the case could be made that women were not excluded if they were just good enough. Well, you know, not every woman neurosurgeon is going to be a successful editor-in-chief of Neuro Journal of Neurosurgery for 20 years, and not every woman a physicist or chemist is going to win, you know, two Nobel Prizes. And sometimes those early stars, there are, you know, racial and other examples of this phenomenon, uh, can eclipse an overall slowing, in fact, of the progress of that group they represent. Anyway, to continue with uh, some the studies of gender diversity in neurosurgery, uh, in Europe, where you have this uh, phenomenon of general surgeons who then increasingly limited their practice to neurosurgery and are counted among the first. So you have Diana Beck and Sophia Ionescu. But the first board certified woman in neurosurgery actually came from Turkey, uh, Professor Altanak. And then I'm happy to say that the first board certified woman in neurosurgery was from my own institution. That was Ruth Kerr Jacobi in 1961. And then this phenomenon of women neurosurgeons, of course, spread through the planet. So you had the small but mighty T.S. Kanaka, who was four foot ten, but a real dynamo in Indian um, in neurosurgery. She just left a, a left us two years ago. You have my good friend, Nasha Elabadi, who is the first woman professor of neurosurgery. And she was uh, uh, the name to that uh, position as recently as 1994. And then many of you will know Alexa Kennedy, who was one of the first woman neurosurgeons in the U.S. and was the first African-American woman neurosurgeon. And uh, she has this double whammy of being both a woman and African-American. Note that Alexa was, uh, or Dr. Kennedy was board certified in 1984. She was, uh, that was a, full 23 years after Dr. Jacoby. Well, what happens when um, minority groups organize? We've heard a lot about identity politics, and there are some bad things, as we all know, about identity politics. But here's maybe a productive example. At least I'd like to think so. So imagine this. This uh, was the first picture taken of, of what became women in neurosurgery. And uh, this is a photograph that captured every woman who was present at the who was present at the Congress of Neurological Surgeons meeting in 1989 in Atlanta. 
it's hard for us to imagine today that you could get all the women who are at one of our annual meetings together for one picture, much less to have a drink and to form a society together. Um, but uh, so we, we are making progress. Um, so that group, little by little, incorporated and started to work together. And uh, we weren't uh, making rapid progress, but by 20 years in, by 2008, the AANS Board of Directors noted that this was a phenomenon and that this group was there to stay. And therefore, the AANS Board of Directors uh, commissioned a white paper on the recruitment and retention of women in neurosurgery, which you see here. And I'm really pleased to say that Jim Bean, who was the president of the AANS at that time, asked to write an editorial to accompany that uh, publication. And Jim has told me that he used the uh, Gettysburg Address as his uh, as his model in putting together this really uh, well-written, uh, I think, editorial. But it concludes by saying, in recognition of the findings of this report, we acknowledge the need for active measures to ensure that every neurosurgeon enjoys the same benefits and opportunities by dismantling the barriers and offering a hand across, and I love this part, the remaining gulfs that separate the privileged from the deserving remaining gulfs that separate the privileged from the, de the deserving. And Dr. Dempsey uh, and all, uh, many of us who've worked with fiends certainly see remaining gulfs that separate the privileged uh, members uh, from low and middle income countries, uh, or, uh, from high income countries uh, that separate us and our opportunities, our ability to be productive from the deserving uh, who are our colleagues in low- and middle-income countries. So the, some of these uh, data will be intuitive to you. Um, we did not see a huge inflection point when that white paper I just presented listed a call to action, but we did see continued gradual progress. Uh, when we started, less than 5% of ABNS certified practicing neurosurgeons were women. Now it's 6%, so that's our progress over a 40-year timeline, but it is progress. You can see that less than 4% of neurosurgeons in the U.S. are black or African, and um, if you're a black woman neurosurgeon, you're less than 1% of all neurosurgeons. And there are barriers to academic progression of women. I think we're familiar with this, both entering the profession, as I've just demonstrated, as well as acceding to the ranks of professor. There's also a pay, pay gap, and uh, uh, this is not only women neurosurgeons, and it, not, uh, but also women in all medical specialties. And it's not only women in neurosurgery, it's also African-American men who are underpaid. Now, gender diversity, we're pleased to have demonstrated just now that it's really started uh, with at the beginning of American neurosurgery and that our um, group of women in neurosurgery started as far back uh, as the 1980s. Other groups are doing this as well. It's a worldwide phenomenon and there has been a WFNS, Women in Neurosurgery Committee, for over 10 years. Interestingly, uh, Europe has only had a diversity task force for two years. So uh, some of these efforts that may seem have been around for a long time really have not. Well, uh, in the process of celebrating the first 100 years of neurosurgery in 2019 to 2020, we uh, developed a series of papers on what are the first contributions of that first century in a variety of areas. But one of them was what contributions had women made. And so this uh, paper was published in February of last year online. And I noted it's actually in print this month. So uh, this paper led to a global effort during pandemic 
to write the history of women neurosurgeons around the world. Um, so let me just draw your attention to the left side of your screen there. This is one of the very few uh, single author papers by Robert Spetzler. It's in the Asian Journal of Neurosurgery. And it's on the progress of women. And I've highlighted one of the things that Dr. Spetzler mentioned in which he says the scant historical literature devoted to women in the field of neurosurgery suggests not that their contributions are less worthy than those of their male counterparts as much as that their contributions have yet to be fully recounted. So during the COVID pandemic and isolation, writing groups of women neurosurgeons on every continent got together by Zoom. And I'm happy to say that there are now papers either published or in press uh, that that basically recount, as Dr. Spetzler asked for uh, 10 years ago, the history of women neurosurgeons around the world. Well, let's move from gender to racial diversity in neurosurgery. Many of you may be aware that of Clarence Green, who was the first African-American neurosurgeon board certified in 1953. Mm -hmm. Deborah Hyde was the second after Dr. Kennedy and has correct, it's not only neurosurgery, but is an outstanding productive philanthropist in Los Angeles today. And then many, many of our uh, Black and African American colleagues have been inspired by this man, Dr. Latunde Odeko, who is the first African American neurosurgeon, but Nigerian born in the United States. He was also trained in the good old Midwest at University of Michigan, in the late 50s, board certified in 61, so the same year as Ruth Kerr Jacoby, he was also a poet, but he was an inspirational mentor to many of our current African-American neurosurgical colleagues. He's a beautiful poet, and that's my copy of Twilight from my bedside stand. So let's fast forward to 2020 and uh, this inflection point that we as an American society and as world leaders, as a world society, uh, had with, with the murder of George Floyd. And people who had never marched before marched, and people, neurosurgeons, our colleagues who had never uh, involved themselves in uh, diversity issues, stepped forward. and. This statement by black neurosurgeons was signed by many of the people that you know and almost everyone in, who's an African-American neurosurgeon in, in America, in which they state that they were in the unique position to speak up about the threats to the black community and that excessive use of police force and violence was a public health issue. So uh, this is just part of the evidence I'm trying to present to you that we are at an inflection point in our field as well as in our society. There are other types of racial diversity. We're making progress uh, in Asian Americans. There are a few who are more respected in our field than Linda Liao, who is the chairman of neurosurgery at UCLA, who has uh, had a tougher road, both because of being a woman and an Asian woman and also an immigrant. There are other types of diversity that uh, we need to talk more about in neurosurgery. There are gender minorities um, that find it hard to make progress in our field. There are immigrants and geographic transplants, and I've presented just three of these, Ghazi Yazergil, Dr. Q, Dr. Sontag, and uh, we're actually uh, working on a study now of neurosurgeons who have been immigrants, and the emerging unpublished data so far suggests that those who have had to face the difficulties of being an immigrant and learning to train or, or work as a neurosurgeon in a different country have developed the kind of resilience that uh, predisposes toward an exceptional career in neurosurgery. Uh, and this may have implications for the kind of immigration policy that we want to have in the United States. 
Or what about neurosurgeons living with a disability? And these are pictures used with permission from two friends and colleagues, uh, Dr. Corinne Morasco, very highly productive, highly respected chairman of neurosurgery at the University of Michigan, seen here uh, doing a case uh, in her wheelchair. Or Michael Biggs, who's a neurosurgeon, and here's a quotation I've put in red um, from him. It is shocking to me that anyone would have said to him that uh, he should go find something else to do, as he would never make a decent neurosurgeon because he stuttered. And yet uh, here we have a pres newly inaugurated president of the United States who also has a stutter. So I will leave it to Shakespeare to uh, have the final word on disabilities and neurosurgery and move on to one that's increasingly been of interest to me, and that is ageism in neurosurgery. You know, when you stop and think about it, we are the first generation in the history of the world in which we are likely to have individuals above age 65 who will have life and hopefully health and finances, resources available to continue giving back. And what are we doing with that? And in the case of neurosurgery, we have individual and societal investment to a huge degree in these individuals. And what are we offering society with the 500 neurosurgeons in North America, for example, who retire every year? So we were asked to write this editorial about this topic in Journal of Neurosurgery. And we took one example is Bill Gates, another is Michael Bloomberg, but people who have had highly successful business careers and yet who at a relatively early age step away from their business careers to focus their efforts on what they call an encore career or a third career, which becomes even more important to them. And I would just ha ask you to think about what we could or should be doing in neurosurgery, which would allow those uh, neurosurgeons between, let's say, uh, 60 and 65 and 80 and 85 to be able to continue to offer their expertise, reminding ourselves that we currently have a global deficit of 23,000 neurosurgeons who are needed to perform the over 5 million emergency and essential neurosurgical operations that don't get done every year. So there, we we have a mismatch, and and we could be thinking more creatively about what to do about it. Well, let's move on then from neurosurgery to what we can learn from other professions. And one great example is the U.S. military, and there are three things that we've learned from that experience. The first is that diversity needs high-level political commitment. If you look at FDR, whose photograph is now hanging in the Oval Office, uh, he wrote this in 1943, but it could speak to our time today, that we must cultivate the science of human relationships, the ability to work with people of all kinds, to live together and work together in the same world at peace. And it was left to his successor, President Truman, to wipe out segregation in the armed forces by his famous executive order. So this was someone at a high political level who took a stand and by executive order took what he saw that was right, desegregating our armed forces, particularly important in light of the, segre of the heroism that was exhibited by African-American troops and African-Americans working on the home front during World War II and said enough is enough and desegregated our armed forces. But it had to happen by one individual in a high position making that determination. And it's been highly successful in terms of recruiting uh, racial and ethnic minorities to our armed forces so that now minorities are overrepresented 
compared to the general population in every branch of the armed forces, but they are still underrepresented in level of flag and general officers. And so that diversity must reach the leadership level as well. And that is why the U.S. Army has a roadmap for that. But in addition to having a roadmap for how to get to where we want to go in the U.S. Army, in a department, as a profession, and everywhere else, there does need to be oversight to make sure that our metrics are tracking toward progress. So in the case of the U.S. military, desegregation and diversity at the leadership level, there is institution, institutional long-term policy commitment in the form of congressional oversight. Well then, let's move on to business. If we omit the argument that inclusion and equity are simply the right thing to do, and we do it on that basis, but we say, we want to be successful, and in the case of business, one is successful by making money. Um, what does diversity do in that space? Well, we know that diversity improves performance, creativity, innovation. It increases competitiveness and improves customer and employee relations. Now, in the interest of time, I've removed a lot of slides. You can look up Harvard Business Review. You can look up uh, any of our major uh, consulting firms, uh, McKinsey, Bain, Booz Allen Hamilton. The one slide I've included is from uh, BCG Boston Consulting Group. That dem they, They've all demonstrated that companies with more diverse leadership teams report higher innovation revenues. So they're doing this not because it's nice, but because the goal is to maximize profits, and it just is demonstrated over and over again that it does. So much so that some are recommending metrics and oversight in the business world like that which I've just demonstrated in the military, and that is to make diversity targets part of compensation, and that this would, disclosing these diversity targets would give top executives a financial incentive to hire and promote more in black Latino people or to provide a public scorecard similar to what was done during the time of South African apartheid so that people could vote with their pocketbooks and shareholders could determine whether they wanted to invest in companies that did or did not uh, promote this type of um, diversity in leadership. And then um, many of us have read about the response to the current pandemic of nations that had women at the helm. And this is probably, at least in my view, not because women are better at managing uh, a national politics during a pandemic, but probably more likely because they have been elected to lead company, uh, countries that have uh, – uh, more of a tendency to be community-oriented in spirit. And then finally, what about the benefits of diversity viewed through an economic and ecological lens? Well, you know, we all know about portfolio diversification, that we shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket. And this kind of seems obvious or intuitive to us now, but in fact, it was not always so. Um, and the work on diversity actually resulted in the 1990 Nobel Prize in Economics for Harry Markowitz, who developed the economic theory of diversification that we all personally kind of think just makes intuitive sense. And that is that Dr. Markowitz and his colleagues showed that, that the more types of investments a person has, the more likely one is to have a net gain with lower risk. So if you look at that top group of economic experts, many of whom are household names, they all were proponents of diversification. And now they are not a di very diverse looking group themselves. So I've also included in the bottom row the some who are up and comers, but all who represent diversity in their 
On the lower right, you see Janet Yellen, who has just been confirmed as Secretary of the Treasury. And, and all of these individuals uh, espouse diversification as a way to maximize profits and minimize risk. And I think we in neurosurgery can learn from them. And then finally, let's ask ourselves, is it merely chance that there are over 5 million species of life on Earth, or is it possible that there's some Darwinian advantage converged even to Mother Nature herself by the presence of such diversity? And here I'm just summarizing literally hundreds of peer-reviewed studies that show that biodiversity improves the average level of performance of a system, it enhances productivity and the stability of a system and improves resilience to negative change. So if we put all the evidence together from ecology and from economics, I think we can say that the evidence shows that if we need the best possible people in, divert, in neurosurgery, we all agree that we do, then excellence and innovation and strength are greatest if we work to diversify our profession. So with that, as I conclude, I want to thank my diverse and wonderful team. Uh, these are all medical students who are very diverse and are going to be adding so much to neurosurgery uh, when they join our ranks. And I'd like to help my other uh, reviewing author, Sean Harvey Jumper, uh, uh, my colleague at UCSF who's a co-author to this paper. And then just a couple things about the graphics that illustrate this talk. Javier Yep is a student from Peru who, for his master's thesis at San Jose State in the United States, uh, designed this flag that I think is quite beautiful. I'm a bit of a budding vexillologist, but this is the university in diversity flag that we use with his permission. And then finally, I would draw you to uh, draw your attention to Jeff Hansen, who is an artist and philanthropist, but of particular note to neurosurgeons. Uh, Jeff has neurofibromatosis and bilateral optic nerve gliomas. He's visually impaired. He's a neurosurgical patient, the shunt in place, and we are using his art with his permission and his parents, and uh, he sees his visual um, challenges as an opportunity to raise money for philanthropy through art. And now at age 26, he's well on his way to raising his first $10 million for good causes through his art. So that's his website, and you can look him up on YouTube. So I thank him for the opportunity to use his art in my talks on diversity. With that, I'll thank you. I love this topic and this conversation, um, so I'll leave you with my uh, email address as well. And with that, I hope we have a few moments for comments or questions. Gail, this is outstanding. I, I can't thank you enough for raising the discussion, starting the discussion, which I hope will continue for years here at, at Wisconsin, and I hope it's been going on for years. I want to also point out that I'm so glad that you are studying this issue, which is so obvious to me, and that how much neurosurgery has benefited from diversity of all types, not just gender, not just race, but the tremendous power of the immigrants in our neurosurgical society. That, uh, you know, if we look at the quality of the applicants who are first or second generation who really, you know, overcome work, who overcome trials. You know, I, I think of one person who's a personal hero who just said, listen, no one's bombing my house. This is, you think I'm working hard? This is nothing. Uh, you know, that, that's, that needs to be said. And, uh, and people, the more we give opportunity to immigrants and, refugees, the better the world is. Well, well done. Open to questions from many other people. Uh, can I start? Yes, please, home guy. Uh, hi, Gail. This is uh, 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 my question. Good to see you. Uh, you too. 
uh, my question is twofold. Your thoughts about over diversifying, meaning that you have two applicants, a boy and a girl, with similar qualifications, or the boy is even uh, more qualified, but people push the girl for the sake of diversifying. And the other part of the question is foreign graduates, being a foreign graduate myself, and Mustafa is a foreign graduate, uh, I think still very, very difficult for a foreign graduate to pull through and get um, a position uh, in the United States. So your thoughts on these two? Thank you very much for that. Well, I'll take your last question first in terms of the foreign graduate. So I'm, I've really gotten interested in this issue. And as, uh, as I said, I'm studying how neurosurgery has benefited from the immigrants within us. You know, it, 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 immigration policy is, is fraught with a lot of, um, a, 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 a lot of vitriol in the United States right now, but uh, so much so that I know it's been said, why can't we get more Norwegians with PhDs? Well, you know, as someone who's of Scandinavian descent, I'm not sort of picking them out of the blue, but what I, what I have noticed is that there appears to be something about the immigrant experience that builds resilience. And that is something we really need in neurosurgery, each and every one of us. We ask about it, every applicant uh, we have as we go through residency interviews. You need to have a thick skin and broad shoulders, and it may be that the immigrant experience actually selects out for that. So um, I think that having been through some some type of personal diversity is important. It sharpens your saw, as Stephen Covey would say, you know, in the habits of highly effective people. The other question you have in terms of what does one do with the equally weighted applicant where one is a minority of some kind and one isn't, uh, and that really gets into the policy discussion of affirmative action. And there's much that goes into that. Uh, I, I'm not someone who believes in quotas, although I know some people do. But I do think that you can take individual circumstances in almost every case, at least at our micro level, when we're, which is what we're talking about in applicancy, applicants for residency. And we can usually find that there is a 5149 proposition so that even if they have the exact same metrics, they have the same GPA, they have the same exact test score, there will be something that is unique to one or the other of those two individuals that your department needs so that your, your department maybe would choose one and a different department would choose another. So that's why I'm not in favor of, of quotas, but I, I am in favor of diversity and, uh, where we can until we get to that point where we don't need to talk about it anymore. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Other questions from the group? I noticed, uh, Dr. Dempsey, in looking at um, your website that you've done, um, you and all of your faculty, a very good job in selecting a diverse group of residents. I'm very proud of them. Uh, don't tell them this, but they're really <laughs> excellent, and the best thing about them is they look after each other. That's really obvious. Um, and again, I have, a, I have a fiducial responsibility to the department to select people who make the department stronger. And that's, uh, you know, there are special needs that you fill that way. This is excellent, yeah. Now, uh, Gail, thanks so much. Uh, are there other questions for Dr. Rousseau? I know people tend to drift to the OR at this time. Um, I, I actually have a quick question. Thank you, now. Hey, uh, so hi, Dr. Rousseau. Thank you for coming hi, and speaking Kyle. with us. Hi, um, I'm one of the 
PGY3s here, and I really appreciate your talk and uh, all of your insight. So uh, one question I had, and I think you might be uniquely positioned to answer this, is about advocacy and policy and getting involved in those. Um, you know, as a neurosurgeon, I feel like most um, careers are built on, um, as an academic neurosurgeon, most careers are built on uh, research um, uh, and or medical education, uh, whereas, you know, I think there's been many neurosurgeons who have sort of had great contributions to society through advocacy and policy. And so I was sort of wondering, as someone who's done these types of things, you know, what were your experiences early on that sort of shaped you? And what are some steps that people sort of maybe in our residency who are interested in, in these facets of, you know, society that, you know, how they could sort of gear themselves up to to contribute in that way going forward? Well, Niall, thank you. That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, you yourself I know to be someone who you know can walk and chew gum at the same time so you can train in neurosurgery and do uh, at a at one of the top places in the United States and still do other things so we just breed people who are able to do more but you know I, I give credit to my mentor my chairman was Ed Laws who was someone who was you know a very very busy productive neurosurgeon who's now done 7,000 lifetime transtenoidals, but also at the same time was the editor of neurosurgery and the president of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. This is who we are as neurosurgeons. And so you, you can do multiple things. I, I, I would say two things. One is your value, your primary value to the world or at least the most rare value that you present to the world is as a neurosurgeon. So you cannot neglect get, getting a very good uh, education and become, being the best neurosurgeon you can be because that's what then becomes your stepping off point for the other things you can do. That's first and foremost. But once you have done that, you yourself and, and all neurosurgeons tend to have other additional energy, and we have a bully pulpit that allows us to be able to use our position as neurosurgeons to speak about other additional societal things. I'll remind you that, you know, Sanjay Gupta is a neurosurgeon, and he is making a difference. And there are, you know, Linda Liao is on the Institute of Medicine and is making a difference. Um, look at, not a neurosurgeon, but Anthony Fauci making a difference. Um, you are needed in, in so many ways. There's so much work to be done that I hope that we will be able to inspire a diverse workforce of neurosurgeons in high and low income countries to start bridging the gaps that we have in access to care so that our challenges won't be diversification. It will be just keeping up with providing great care to everyone everywhere. You know, I think it was Martin Luther King who said that of all the inequity in human experience, inequity in healthcare is uh, the most shocking and the most inhumane. So I'm eager for a time when the enemy is the trauma and the disease, and we can all unite together and put our collective talent and energy to work exclusively on that enemy. Thank you, Gail. Um, I'm going to, if there are, are there other questions at this time? If not, go ahead. If not, I'm going to thank Gail. This has been exactly what I hoped. It gets us talking, gets us thinking, and uh, they can be no greater gift. So thanks so very much. Uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.